You and I met really 1980s, right? We worked together at Intel until early 90s, until I left Intel. Uh, you were really involved in microprocessor group. I was in the, what I call, networking side of the chips that are enabling processor to interact with the CPUs. And then over the years, we went different ways. So I think it would be great if you, Pat, if you can introduce yourself a bit as well as the uh, talk about your company. Yes, I'd love to. And uh, you know, I've been uh, in the industry now for 40 years. As you say, we had the great pleasure of working together at uh, Intel Oregon for a number of uh, years. But 30 years at Intel, uh, did 14 generations of microprocessors for Intel, you know, worked in the labs, helped to create USB and Wi-Fi. After uh, 30 years, uh, did the unthinkable. I left Intel and uh, moved to the East Coast for EMC for three years. And we had a wonderful time there, but moving from silicon to systems. And then uh, EMC is the majority owner of VMware, moved me back to the West Coast to uh, become CEO in 2012 of VMware. And VMware is uh, number five software company in the world. You know, we do the cloud data center infrastructure uh, software, about 11 billion in revenue, 33,000 employees, and uh, just been an incredible ride now to see silicon systems and now software and cloud at scale. Been a real, uh, uh, just a Cinderella career, as I like to call it. Yeah, you know, I remember when you, you left Intel because you were at the time CTO of Intel Corporation and the uh, very, very powerful job, very important job. And uh, when you left, went into EMC, we were wondering what the plan was. But actually now when you're looking back, you're, you had a great move, great career move, going from hardware, semiconductor to subsystem, subsystems to really the software company that really today without what you've been doing, the virtualizing all the tools and softwares, we wouldn't be able to run our cloud applications. Yeah, it really has been incredible that way. And I've sort of seen my career right in these uh, episodes and uh, clearly the days of Intel. And uh, I remember I had left Intel uh, and Andy Grove said, you can go to Stanford and finish your PhD or you can stay here and fly the jet. And uh, that was just one of those seminal moments where it's sort of like, huh, running the 46? That was a pretty important uh, moment in career. And in fact, I got one of 46 plots still hanging on my wall here behind me. And uh, then, right, you know, as you'd say, I'm moving into subsystems at EMC. And, you know, when you've been in the culture for 30 years, you know, everything is through the lens of that culture. It was such a dramatic shift, East Coast, West Coast, hardware, systems versus silicon, but now software. And I've always sort of wanted my career to sort of be where the center of action is at young. You know, where is the disruption, the maximum innovation going on? And clearly today that's in cloud and software and SaaS services. And it really has been a uh, incredible period of time to be at the epicenter of uh, clouds and now uh, mobile uh, networks and 5G and AI really have been a, a great blessed uh, career. And uh, like you, uh, life has given us a very, very great journey and uh, many, many good fortunes along the way. So well, thank you. Now I'm gonna change the subject a little bit to the moment that we are in. We're in the midst of pandemic. And clearly you are working out of home. I know like Samsung operations in California shut down since March 15th. I don't even know it's going to be opening the door this year. This is why I'm in Berlin, but I think that it will continue to go on for a while until we have a clear vaccine to help us to manage this situation. But obviously the show must go on. We cannot stop working. And so we are working out of wherever you are. But I'd like to understand how you're managing pandemic personally as well as organizationally. Yeah. Well, you know, since March, and I sort of said, you know, on Friday, uh, the 28th of February, we were planning a physical sales event. We made the decision Friday afternoon to go virtual and we haven't stopped since. Literally over the weekend, we flipped the company. We became a virtual company literally over a weekend. And we were maybe 20% work from home. 
uh, before the pandemic. We went to 97%. And my predictions of what I've said is that on the other side of this, and we've begun our permanent work from home policies today, right? Mm -hmm. We launched these about uh, three weeks ago that we said everybody can pick their workplace. Right, you could decide if it's Germany, uh, if it's uh, Portola Valley, Idaho, you get to pick your work location. And we expect that we'll probably end up with 50-ish percent permanently work from home, maybe 30-ish percent hybrid, and 20% as office dwellers. So we're gonna go on from 20% work from home to 20% office dwellers in this course. You know, so just a dramatic shift uh, in our work policies, people are relocating. We're finding it's able to hire more diverse workforce. People are commuting less and our productivity has been high. But you also see that you go from Zoom to Zoom to Zoom. I describe some of the meetings that I'm joining that I, as I zoom into people's uh, homes, it's like a combination of a WeWork office, a kinder care, and a pet smart. Right, all sort of, you, you know, just sort of a little bit of chaos in that sense. So we're all needing to make these adjustments. You know, personally, I've been in the office maybe seven times since March, right? I haven't had dinner with my wife this many days in a row forever, right? You know, so in some ways you're sort of saying this is good. At the same time, you have to make adjustments to enable people. And we've given, uh, since March, we've given two extra days off. We've called them pandemic days. Right, epic days. You're not allowed to send email today. Just telling the whole company, just take a break because the pace can be so intense at this point from meeting to meeting to meeting and sitting in that chair too long. We've changed our meeting times to 25 and 50 minutes. You know, get up, take a stretch, you know, move around. You know, and personally, hey, you know, in the middle of the fires, the social unrest and the pandemic, I got a little bit fatigued as well myself. I needed to take a little bit of a break. So Pat, I got a question for you. As we are more relying on cloud or multi-cloud, and we, when we are moving all of our data out there, how, what is your view of security and private issues that are continue to be going to be exposed? And as you know, I've been involved with Zoom uh, from very early on. I'm a very lucky person to see the transition happening. Even Zoom had a really difficult time dealing with the changes from, you know, just enterprise video to consumer video, educational video, and obviously you're not ready for all these vertical applications. So uh, I'm really just uh, wondering what's your view about how do you keep our data private? Yeah, and you know, overall, uh, I gave a speech uh, a year and a half ago at the RSA conference, Young, and I stood mm -hmm. at you know, the premier security conference and I stood up and I said, this is a broken industry to everybody in the security industry. As I say, it's a way to make friends and influence people or to piss everybody off. And uh, for it, you know, security, thousands of products and companies, and yet we're spending more and losing more on security. So security hasn't kept up. And technology, it's used by the good guys and the bad guys. And fundamentally, you know, we believe that uh, the security industry has spent way too much time chasing the bad guys as opposed to building barriers. And we say instead of respond, you know, detect and respond, we need to prevent. And we've laid out our security strategy is what we call intrinsic security. We acquired Carbon Black last year. Uh, we're integrating it into every one of our products because we believe that companies need far fewer products what they need is integrated into their application development and into their infrastructure intrinsically. We're moving to this model of security called zero trust security, where unless you're explicitly given access, you don't have it, right? And this, this we believe is a fundamental shift to the security industry because every aspect of life is coming on to our digital platforms. We must, in the interest of humanity, do a much better job with security, privacy, Efforts like HIPAA and GDPR, you know, must be taken to higher levels than ever before. And uh, we hope to be one of those companies that help drive the industry to accomplish that because humanity is looking for us to be successful on exactly those objectives. Great. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad VMware is working on this. I also noticed you're announcing some interesting partnership with Jensen regarding the, uh, some of the, uh, what I call data processing units, DPU. 
They can provide a uh, smart data storage, data security. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that too. To me, it's more of an accelerator for specific applications without using a lot of CPU bandwidth. Yeah, yeah. We did two major announcements with Jensen. One is the democratization of AI. And uh, today, AI as a technology is used by enterprises. Maybe 10 to 15% of enterprises are using AI today. One of the most powerful technologies today, but it's not generally available. Only in you know, specific clouds, still very complex. So Jensen and VMware are working together so that every data center and edge can utilize AI on the VMware platform. All of the work that Jensen has done in GPUs and their full software stack coming to the VMware platform, making it fully available to enterprises. The other is smart NICs. And this is where the power inside of the NIC now may have eight, 16, 32 CPU cores inside of it. And being able to use that to move all of the network security processing, building on our last topic, right, directly into the network and enabling us to become essentially, you know, the traffic manager of the entire data center, including bare metal servers as well. So these two generalizing the GPU and generalizing the DPU really says we're distributing the compute capabilities of the data center, GPU, CPU, and DPU, and enabling that distributed platform, not only in the data center, but to the cloud and to the edge. And that combination we think is really gonna bring about the next generation of data center architecture, and we'll start delivering uh, these capabilities uh, uh, next year. So quite, quite an exciting set of things that we're doing with our old friend Jensen. Very, very exciting. Obviously, the Samsung perspective, we are really excited about this because it, it enables the combination of different type of architecture with new kind of storage and memory that can be able to enable this type of a solution that are probably not going to be done in discrete chips anymore. It's becoming modules that are coming together in terms of a multiple really chips that are all bonded in three-dimensional way so that we can be able to increase the throughput and having the right kind of interconnect. In fact, in some ways, because of the amount of data that are required, we probably need to go optical interconnect even between chip to chip. Yeah, I de definitely believe that, you know, radically increased data sets and clearly big data, AI, essentially the data sets that are being formed are bigger than ever. And being able to then move that data Right, requires increasing bandwidths in the data center and between cloud and edge. And an increasing use of optical uh, connections will become more and more prevalent uh, uh, as a result. So leveraging some of the work you and I were doing way back at Intel many years ago. I know, I remember you know, back then it was the future, but now it looks like we are in the reality of um, where those technology is needed. And we're getting there. Yep, great progress we're making. And obviously the role that Samsung plays and VMware and NVIDIA are playing uh, uh, huge amounts of uh, breakthroughs. Let's talk about the future. So uh, clearly there are many new things in front of us. And I wanna pick your brain in terms of what you get really excited about. I'm sure one of them should be a 5G, I hope. But just tell us like, what are those key three or four things you get really excited about and why? Yeah, well, one of them certainly is 5G. And uh, I uh, spoke on this in my VMworld keynote uh, last week. You know, and there's uh, uh, several aspects of 5G that thrill me. You know, one is, is that, you know, 4G and LTE were consumer driven. I believe 5G will be business driven, right? Lower latencies, higher bandwidths, better security models, higher connectivity. All of this will enable new edge-based use cases that weren't possible before. You know, part of the reason autonomous vehicles and so on haven't really taken off is because the tech, the underlying technology isn't good enough. And I think 5G will be the technology that makes it good enough that we can start to deploy this. But secondly, it's not just that we're going to build 5G, we're going to build it the right way. And for this, you know, much like we used to have data centers that were vertical systems in the past young, Right? You know, where you had hardware, software, applications from, you know, one vendor. Well, that's the way telco is still built. 
5G will be built as a horizontal cloud-driven architecture with standardized hardware operating system. And we're pursuing be, you know, VMware being that 5G operating system of the core and the RAN and a explosion of applications and services that run on top of that connecting up to cloud and edge. So it will be built in a different way. But third, it will also, you know, we believe, you know, not just be in the core and the edge, but it will also be deployed, right, enabling this connectivity to the cloud, right, as well as into the enterprise. And I believe that enterprise 5G and unlicensed 5G will displace Wi-Fi for numerous use cases, if not entirely. Uh, over time. So enterprise 5G, where IT shops will run the 5G in their factories, in their manufacturings, in their distribution centers. So it will become this pervasive connectivity uh, as well. So because of that, we're betting heavily on uh, 5G as one of those technologies that will be foundational and usher in many innovations around it. So I'm quite excited and clearly Samsung's bet on this very aggressively uh, as well. And I look forward to us cooperating more in this area also. Uh, absolutely. We are very excited about 5G. In fact, we're investing, this would be other than semiconductor, it'll be the biggest area of investment Samsung is making. In particular, in the both, not only in the device side, but also in networking side, as well as the architecture, underlying architecture that can support the kind of bandwidth. You know, uh, by the way, I want to thank you because uh, as an as a advisor to Silver Lake, an investor of uh, Dell and VMware and EMC combination, I've been very happy with uh, the way it came about. It was a very risky deal back then with a lot of that very gigantic, gigantic deal combination of companies. People couldn't imagine there, EMC, VMware all coming together. But I think that outcome has been very, very successful. And a lot of the success and credit goes to you. VMware really carried the weight. Yeah, and you know, I think there was, you know, in that period of time, and you know, young, this is one of, you know, maybe another lesson for your viewers here. Um, in the middle, you know, of the, the deal had been announced. So Dell was acquiring EMC, VMware as part of that. And there was this dreadful period of time. And uh, in a few days, there were rumors that I was being fired. There were rumors that I was going to run Dell. There were rumors that we were going to get spun out. And at the same period of time, I had a son who was undergoing cancer treatment. And he's fine now, Hodgkin's lymphoma. I had also broken my foot playing racquetball. So I have- I remember that. Foot. Yeah, I have a broken foot, right? You know, a son in cancer treatment and all of these rumors. In fact, I was at a, an event and Michael Dell was sitting next to me and my head of PR sends me a text saying there's an article about to be published saying that Michael's gonna fire you today. And I'm right next to Michael. So I lean over to Michael and I said, is there something you haven't told me? Right? Because we're both about to go on stage together and we both got a laugh out of it. But a dreadful period of uh, time in it. And I told the board, I said, unless you fire me, I will get VMware to the other side of this. And that's sort of this period of grit where you have to lift your organization. You have to be this point of optimism, this clarity of vision to take the company through the tough times. And that is part of your job as a leader. Clearly, we've come to the other side of that. As you say, we've emerged sort of as the, you know, as the golden child uh, in this uh, family and uh, have been able to uh, produce uh, you know, substantial expansion in the equity value, uh, be able to produce great cash flows to pay down the debts and dividends, and overall you know, being able to chart a very bold path uh, into the future. So, you know, the great, the confidence building is a lot of what I call, you know, to me, it's an Intel training as well. You know, both of us work with Andy Grove, he was a tough guy, but also once he survived, you build a lot of confidence on your ability to navigate difficult times. Yeah, I used to joke, I said, uh, mentoring with Andy Grove was like going to the dentist and not getting Novocaine, right? He was tough, he was hard, yeah. right? If you were 95% yeah. right, you were wrong, right? <laughs> he was just really, really, but he made you better. 
And every yes, one of us absolutely. needs people in your life like that. You need mentors like Andy Grove that they're in your corner, right? They're committed to you, but man, they're going to knock the rough edges off of you. They're going to expose the full facet of the diamonds that you are that everybody needs the Andy Groves in their life. Right. So, you know, it's interesting because both of us learned a lot from that early job training in, you know, early 20s career. Great, great learning experience. And I have to say, much of my training and management come from that early days of, uh, you know, spending time. So what are some of the things you are still applying to your team to build a grid in your organization? And what are you not using it from the, what you learned? Because I think it's not only what you learned, but also learn what not to use. Would it be an interesting lesson for some folks that are in, in the show here? Yeah, yeah. So let me very quickly, you know, I have a, a leadership speech that I give called the five L's of leadership. Leaders need to listen. They need to link. They need to learn, they need to lift, and they need to love. And I call it the five L's of uh, leadership. You know, you need to become a person lifting the, the organization, just like I described in the Dell EMC merger, right? You need to build a listening organization, right? You know, one that, you know, two ears, one mouth, listen, right? You know, you don't want to be a hippo, right? Highest paid person's opinion right? Where you pollute the organization just to you know, listen to you, right? You need to be the team linking or building the teams uh, together, right? You need to uh, learn from your mistakes, make it okay. But ultimately, and maybe more in a period of time, I've called it linking urgency and empathy, right? You need to be saying, oh, I need to love, you know, I need to demonstrate, you know, a deep concern for all of the individuals in the organization. But at the same time, I'm going to set a path to the future. I love what we're doing and I'm going to be the one leading. You know, one of the not lessons that I haven't brought forward, you know, Intel was a tough culture. And often you would get results by destroying individuals or destroying relationships. And to me, I've come to realize over the years since then that relationships trump results. And now every meeting, I start at the personal level. How are you doing, young? How's your wife? I haven't seen her for a while. How are the kids, right? Always starting because if people know that you care, right? They'll care much more about you, the team and the organization. And particularly in a period of time like COVID, you know, that mm -hmm. relational aspect is so, so powerful. That's really outstanding. Cause I re as you recall, we did learn about this very famous word, constructive confrontation. And you know, you can say it's a constructive, at the end of the day, or if, if we don't feel good about it, when I get home, you know, my stomach is twisted, that's not a good feeling. And, and that relationship cannot be too positive, although you may get the job done. So I remember thinking my first one year at Intel, that was a really tough thing to get used to. Obviously, we all survived, so we are survivor of that camp. But sounds like we both learned constructive confrontation need to be managed with the empathy and personal relationship that are more important than just getting it done. Yeah, well said, well said, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, very great. I have one last question, which is to do with uh, more to do with tech for good. As you know, I've been talking a lot about uh, uh, the sum of initiatives around the extreme tech challenge uh, in the past. And uh, I'm glad that VMware is also involved with some of our projects here. But the idea is really around technology can be good, or can be bad, it all depends on how you use. And we believe tech can do a lot better things to do for particularly around the UN 17 sustainability goals. So I found a nonprofit called extremetechchallenge.org and we've been recruiting corporations and startups to work together. Together we can accelerate innovation for something good that can address the equality issues, access issues, food issues, and the, uh, you know, some of the global climate challenge issues. So I think these are some of the things that I really signed up. I really believe that we have a long way to go for the, our future generation. But I'd like to get your perspective, what VMware and what you are doing, because I know you're working on this area as well. Yeah, thank you, Young. And first, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you for the XTC, the Extreme Tech Challenge, 
right? You know, the, the focus that you brought, not just to help innovation and entrepreneurship, but a real passion, right, for how it can be for good. Like you said, technology, it's neutral, right? You know, is the printing press good or bad? It was neutral. You know, it could print the Bible, right? Or it could print propaganda, right? <laughs> you, know, right? you know, it's neutral, right? And we, as the tech community, need to be constantly seeking how do we bend that arc of technology and every day make it more good, right? How do we accentuate the good uses for it? How do we protect from the bad? How do we participate in the policy debates? You know, imagine a politician, right? You know, maybe they were a lawyer, maybe a farmer, maybe a small business. They don't know tech, right? And technology isn't a statement, right? It's a direction. Right, it's evolving every single day. And we technologists must be more committed for good. Is social media good or bad? In many cases, it's brought more people together, right? It's also used as a pariah to create some of the worst aspects of humanity and to right, uh, uh, leap on the vulnerable. We must be shaping technology as a force for good every day. And I believe we need to be building that into our organizations. We need to say, how do we reduce the carbon footprint? How do we handle privacy for the individual? And how do we participate in the policy debates to best govern the trade-offs of the direction of technology, the needs of the people, and the business requirements at the same time? All of these require more and more responsibility. You and I, we started as young engineers. Right? <laughs> you know, we didn't think about any of these things. We were just getting our jobs done. Right, but mm. now we've become the most important aspect of humanity's evolution. It's a responsibility for us that we have to carry with enthusiasm, you know, confidence and commitment to truly be shaping technology as a force for good. Very proud of what you've done here. And uh, literally I and all of the 33,000 at VMware and all of our customers and partner, I preach this all the time. We must be a force that is making technology for good. Well, you know, it's great to hear that. And I'm not surprised that you became the, voted as the best CEO in America on Glassdoor last year. So congratulations. Thank you, Young. Thank you, Young. And these and a few other things are you know, part of the trademarks that I hope to continue driving forward into the future. Right? It's always so good to see you, my friend. Come and visit. We have a bike ride we got to get out and do. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely.